Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bech Horath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Now, this mighty man of power is talking about Saul's father, was not only a wealthy man, but he was a man of power in the tribe of Benjamin in Israel. So he had distinguishing characteristics. Now, Saul, you already know this from Sunday school. I hope you went to Sunday school and learned this. Saul was a head taller than anybody else in Israel. If you was to have seen Saul in a crowd, you would have picked him out because he was taller than anyone else. His statue was overwhelming sometimes and uh, 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 it was a a place that that God planted this man for a season. Verse 2 said, And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upwards he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, was lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise and go seek the ass. In other words, go chase them. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. What an awesome message, God, that you have given us. Two of them, Lord, to remind us that you're soon coming. Lord, I pray for the body of Christ. I pray for every pastor this morning in the pulpit that's addressing a congregation. I pray for that anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage. And Lord, I pray for that anointing that makes preaching easy. God, that our minds be stayed upon the mind of the Spirit. Lord, in this message that you've placed in my heart and my spirit, I pray for deliverance of this message. God, that every ear that hears it will be stirred in their heart. Every backslider this morning, God will be moved by the Spirit of the living God. Now, Lord, we are praising you and glorifying you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. I got three things I want to talk to you about this morning. Number one is your daddy did not call you. Your mother did not call you. Your grandmother did not even call you into the ministry. You're called with a holy calling. And when God called you, the devil painted a a bullseye on your back. The devil took off and said, I'm going to discourage you from whatever God's called you to do. I'm going to move you away and I'm going to just turn you away from the blessings and the favor of God because I know what's going to happen if you concede to the call of God. Saul was called of God, but he didn't know it at this point. And his daddy gave him a, a tremendous task. Now, in this period of time, they would turn the donkeys or the goats, they would turn them out into what we would call open range or an open pasture, and they just let them go. They'd let them eat where they wanted to, breed where they wanted to, raise where they wanted to, but they did have the seal of the family upon that animal. So every shepherd or every person that came by them looked upon that seal, and they said, well, this is from the tribe of Benjamin. This is Kish's a donkey right here. I mean, they were scattered everywhere. Whose tribe of you? Are they any seal upon you? Are they any seal upon you this morning that people would know that you belong to Jesus? We've been sealed by the power of His blood. We've been sealed by salvation. We've been sealed by the baptism of the Holy Ghost with fire, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gives the utterance, are we sealed? Can people see the seal of God upon us? Can they hear that seal in us when we begin to talk? I sat down in a man's dining room this week and uh, he'd been through a lot of things and uh, over the last few months and last several years. And I sat down at the end of the table with him and he and I are good friends and I began to talk to him. And at first it started off with trivial conversation. And then all of a sudden the Lord kicked in. How many knows God don't mix words? When God gets to the point, He moves all the clutter out of the way. Amen. I want you to just move all the clutter out of the way this morning because God's going to get to the point. And I talked to Him. He's a backslider. But one good thing about being a backslider, you're married. 
Amen. God doesn't ever forsake his covenant of marriage. Amen. It was sealed by the blood of his only son. So that covenant is intact. Jeremiah said in the third chapter, I'm married to the backslide, I-N-G, backsliding. In other words, no matter how far you go back there, I'm still married to you and I'm gonna pull on your heart. Well, God pulled on his heart this week, amen? So we understand something, God's after us. You may not know what God has for you today, but I want you to understand he's got something planned for your life. Your life is in the hands of God And I want to tell you this also, that sometimes God allows you to be carried through multiple things before you get to where God's final, perfect will of God is in your life. Amen? That's what happened to Saul here. His daddy came to him and said, Saul, or son, I want you to get a servant. It's very notable that you have a servant. Amen? It's notable that you have someone you can depend on, someone you can trust in, somebody that'll go with you, somebody that'll help you, somebody that'll be an extra pair of eyes, extra pair of ears, extra knowledge. You know, sometimes two, four eyes is better than just two. Those of you who got glasses on, you understand what I'm talking about. It's a help to us. <laughs> Amen. It's a help to us. So he said, I want you to get the servant and carry him with you. Well, we have a servant, servants because we're saved. The Holy Ghost helps us. Amen. He's the third member of the Godhead. You need to invite him into your life on a daily basis. Oh, I feel the Lord in the house. You need to invite him. If you haven't invited him, you don't have one. If you haven't invited him daily, he hadn't been with you. That's the reason you've been struggling is because the servant hadn't been with you. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. When Abraham sent his servant to look for Isaac a bride, he sent a servant which is a type of the Holy Ghost, the third member of the Godhead, to search out all the the available young ladies that was going to be at the well for uh, Isaac to have a, a, a wife. So I'm telling you this morning that you can't make it without the Holy Ghost. Amen. You've got to have somebody come alongside of you. Paracletus in the Greek means one that comes alongside. Uh, when the Bible reference uh, in the 14th chapter of John, when it says that the Holy Ghost is going to be a comforter, that word comforter in the Greek is paracletus, and it means he's going to come alongside of you. And, and you've got to ask him, you've got to welcome him, you've got to invite him because he's a perfect gentleman. He will not force himself on you, but he'll fight for you if he stands there. He'll pray for you if you'll stand there. He'll do all those things that you need if you'll just invite him in. Boy, that's a preaching right there now. If you'll just invite him, he'll come. And listen, he don't come empty-handed. I said he brings the resources of heaven with him. He brings knowledge. He brings wisdom. He brings power. He brings the authority of heaven with him when he comes and takes his place beside you this morning. Amen. Listen, Saul, Kish said, I've lost my donkeys. They're out there, been out there a long time. I don't know where they're at. I I want you to get a servant. And I want you to go look for them. Amen. And Saul got him a servant and he got him a little sack lunch and a little water and he took off. He probably thought when he left home, I'll be home back by dark. Because this may be a small task. You know, when you started out serving the Lord, you said, I'm, I'm going to serve the Lord all my life. The Lord's going to come right now anyway. I'm not going to have to struggle long. But let me tell you something. It's been a long time, 35 years since my wife and I have been saved, and we're still on the trail. We're still on the battlefield. We're still in the pulpit. We're still on our knees. We're still in the Bible. Come on, somebody. Amen. The devil will discourage you if you listen to him, but you cannot listen to him. So here's what happened. Saul, now the Bible said he was a choice man. He'd already proved himself to his daddy. He'd already showed his father he was responsible. So they took off and they started looking for the donkeys. They was chasing them here and there and probably found a footprint and said, this is my daddy's donkey. Let's take a right and let's go down this way. 
and then found another donkey track and took a left and went down another road. He was chasing those donkeys and every step he made, listen to this now, every step he made, he was leaving his father's house. The security of his daddy. Amen. He was leaving his comfort zone. Have you ever left your comfort zone? Amen. Chasing donkeys. He had his mind on those donkeys. Now those things are cantankerous sometimes because Baal, a prophet, the old prophet, backslidden prophet was sitting on one and he's going, to, I can just see him, can't you, just riding down that little old trail and doing everything God told him not to do, saying everything God told him not to say and trying to do what God didn't want him to do and he's just trailing on that little old donkey, just bloop, 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 bloop. And all of a sudden that old donkey run into an angel. <laughs> sometimes donkeys see better than we do. <laughs> Sometimes animals sees better than we do. You know, Noah sent out a raven off the ark to looking for dry land and he didn't come back. I didn't expect him to, but I reckon Noah did. But <laughs> sometimes you can send things out and you say, well, I'm going to see that again. And you don't ever see it. You can just wave bye-bye, amen. So the second thing he sent off was a dove. Now, you know, a dove, we want to hug that dove and we want to cuddle that dove and it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit when Jesus was in Jordan being baptized of John the Baptist so it, it just a, a little old spirit but if you really want to know the, the character of a dove that's a warring bird he lays his eggs on the ground he don't build a nest in a tree he lays his nest uh, eggs on the ground and he looks after that egg you don't mess with a dove's egg cause he'll eat you alive don't let the exterior of a dove fool you don't let the exterior of a Christian fool you. Amen. We may smile and we may walk and we may talk so joyously, but when we get on our knees before God, we are warriors for Jesus Christ. We'll enter into his presence with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise. Amen. There's something about somebody that'll pray and seek the face of God. Amen. Here's Saul with his servant. I imagine he leaned on him, Brother Randy, several times during this little ordeal of trying to find his daddy's donkeys chasing after them. And every step he was just leaving his household behind. And, and listen, uh, in the providences of God, even lost things work out God's will with we human lives. We human beings, are, our lives are worked out even though we're chasing donkeys. Amen. What did it take for you to get here? What did it take you to get this place in God? Are you willing to take 30 pieces of silver for what you've already accomplished in God? Amen. Are you really willing to just lay it down and walk away from it? Boy, I'm talking to somebody now. Amen. Because we're talking about chasing donkeys. So if you're out there chasing donkeys, let me tell you something. What are you willing to take for what God has for your life? I'm going to tell you, this is not a Sunday school way. Amen. It's not a picnic here, I mean. Amen. When you serve the Lord, you better get ready to fight. The world don't have to do nothing to do what they do, but if you're going to be a Christian, you better get ready to fight. You better have a sword, and it better be sharp. You better have a shield, and it better be thick. You better have something that God's put in your hand to fight the battles, because God's put you in a place where you've got to fight. Don't give up the fight. Get in that fight and fight with all you got. Somebody give God praise in the house. So Saul, after a while, he, he come to this place. The Bible said they came to uh, Shalisha. Shalisha means treble land. Treble means three. In searching for the donkeys and chasing them, he came to a land where there was three problems here. And this land, was it was a, a, a place in Palestine. They don't know exactly the pinpoint geographical area, but they know it was between mountains and in valleys. So in your pursuit of the donkeys, you're having to go up mountains. How many knows it's not easy to climb a mountain? You have to go over that top, then you got to come back down, and that's not hardly the bad part. Then you got a valley to face. In the valley, the winds hardly don't blow. In the valley, you just, when you're in that valley, you're fighting battles and God's uh, trying to get a hold of you and you just can't seem to hear or have a direction. So that's the place of Shalasta. So we understand that that's the first place they stopped. 
And I can just imagine he was still fresh. You know, when you first got saved, the first battle that you fought was a fresh battle. Boy, the devil didn't even hang around me for about a year when I got saved. He couldn't do nothing with me for about a year. But after a while, he figured out, yeah, I know how to get a hold of him now. So here Saul was and his servant. Saul never was without his servant. Amen. So they got to this treble land. And when they got to this treble land, I can imagine he said, well, man, this is going to be it. I'm going to find daddy's donkeys and I'm going back to the house. I'm going to drink some cold tea. I'm going to eat a hamburger. I'm going to do all those things when I get back to daddy's house. But little did he know it didn't happen that way. It means three times as much problems here. Number one, there's disappointment here. If you don't accomplish your work the first time, don't be disappointed. If you don't accomplish your goal the first time, don't be disappointed. Just regroup. Reload. My daddy taught me something when I was a kid, when I was growing up. He would carry me squirrel hunting. And he'd give me a single shot. He didn't want me to shoot all my shells at one time. And back then there was a limit on squirrels. It was eight. I don't know what the limit is now. I hadn't hunted them in years. And my daddy would tell me, put eight shells in your pocket. And boy, you better come out of them woods with eight squirrels. Back in them days, he bought my shells, so I had to do what daddy said. And we'd get to the woods and we'd be behind Uncle John's old cotton house and down at the bottom of the old log road, there wasn't no logging then, but the log road was left and we split. Daddy went up and I went down the river. And I'd stuck them, I'd put that one of them shells in that old shotgun, single shot 12 gauge and I'd walk and I wouldn't even shoot at a squirrel till I knew I could kill him. Amen. You know, sometimes we just shoot. Yeah, that's right. Come on. We just shoot. We don't know what we're aiming at. We, we, we don't know if it's too far away yet, but we just shoot. We step out ahead of God and the Lord says, Satan, get thee behind me. We, ooh, I'm preaching to somebody this morning. We're just out there shooting. When we're not aiming. We're just out there making a racket. <laughs> when we get out there sometimes, we just, we make a racket and we make a racket. We, the devil, he may t- get our, you know, we may get the devil's attention, but we're not gonna move him just with our racket. We got to move him with the presence and the power and the will and the consistency of God in our life. That's what we move the devil with. Amen. So the first thing here in this treble land was disappointment. He was disappointed. And the second thing was uh, uh, fail. The, the fear of failure was here. What if I don't find my daddy's donkeys? How, what's daddy going to think about me if I don't find them donkeys? What if you don't accomplish what God wants you to to start with? Amen. What if you fail at this thing? What if you get up there and you're called to preach and you get up there and you make a mess? What if you get up there and you don't have anything to say? That used to be one of my worst fears. Lord, what if I get in there and I ain't got nothing to say? Well, y'all see, I don't have a problem with that. I defeated that 27, 8 years ago. I don't have a problem with something to say. But there's a fear of failure. What if I don't get my father's donkeys back? And no doubt he told that servant, we got to keep looking. We got to keep looking in this treble land, amen? They got to be here somewhere. And they kept looking and they kept looking and they kept looking. And the third thing is his confidence. Oh man, let me tell you about confidence. Confidence Your confidence is affected by your eyes. Because if you don't see something materialize pretty soon, then you have to go by faith. Confidence means that you're going to carry this confidence. I'm going to, I'm going to do the will of the Father. I'm going to have God do in me what He wants to do. I've got confidence in God. But Saul, his confidence was on trial here because he didn't even see a track of any of the donkeys at treble land. Amen? Didn't see a track here. He is disappointed. 
He was afraid of failure. And his confidence was at an all-time low. I just don't know. I don't believe I'm going to find him here. I, I got to move. So he moved on. You can't get stuck in disappointment. Come on now. You, you, you can't live your life in disappointment. You can't live your life in a worry that you're going to fail. And you can't live your life without confidence. I'm confident of this one thing, Paul said. I believe that he's able to keep that which I've committed into his hands against that day. I'm confident of that one thing. You've got to have confidence in God. You can't lose any of those three things. Amen? So they kept traveling. And the Bible said they went on down to Shalim. Now, Shalim means foxes. Boy, we could spend some time here on foxes. We used to sing a song when we were children. The devil, he's a sly old fox. If I could catch him, I'd put him in a box. If I could put him in a box, I'd lock that box and throw away the key for all the tricks he's played on me. Saul was aware of the foxes at Shalim. He looked around and a fox is a wiry animal. I mean, they're very smart. They're very cunning. They're, they, they are quick as a wink. They can be slow. Boy, I'm, I'm preaching now. They can be quick as a wink. The devil sometimes is fast Amen. and furious yes. Come on. and tenacious. Yes. The Bible said, Peter told it this way, he is as a roaring, roaring lion. Yes. And he walketh about. He's looking for somebody that's camped out in Shalim because all the disappointments is on you. All the, all the failures is on you. Well, I just couldn't believe I couldn't find them donkeys and up here shall I ask. I couldn't believe I couldn't find them there. And then all of a sudden your confidence is at an all time low and the devil pounces on you. That fox looks for something that's wounded. A fox won't attack an elk, but he'll attack an elk's calf if it's wounded or it's limping. It'll chase a rabbit. A fox knows his territory. He knows his limitations. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that word, limitations. Do you know your limitations? Amen. The Lord said, I'm not looking at your limitations. I'm looking at your availability. I'm looking at your availability. If you'll just be available, I'll let you take the gates off of the city of Samaria and let you run all the way top to the hill and throw them down. I'll let you take a thousand, a jawbone of an ass and slay a thousand Philistines. If you're just available to me, I'll move mountains that no man can move. I'll move things that nobody can move. I'm looking for somebody, amen, that'll get out of this shalim and don't let the devil trick you and that you'll reach out and get a hold of God sometimes we act like we the powerless faithless uh, numb mindedest people in the world when we have the power of heaven in our hands the power of the word of God in our heart and God's given us power amen to be witnesses in Judea and Jerusalem and in the uttermost parts of the earth God's given us power to do these things amen but we've been busy chasing donkeys. Just running around the countryside. Not accomplishing anything. When you chase a donkey, you're not accomplishing anything. Have you ever seen a mockingbird in the springtime of the year and she's hatched her eggs and these varmints come looking for them and she'll fly down out of that nest and she'll hit the ground and she'll act crippled and she'll flutter that wing and she'll, she'll walk and she'll lay down a minute. She'll fall, but she don't ever keep her eye off of the enemy. But what she's doing is distracting that enemy, that cat, that dog, that bird, to get them away from the nest. And then when she gets them at a safe distance, she'll pick up and fly right on off. Nothing's wrong with her. You know, sometimes we chase donkeys. The devil will lead us out here. We've got to learn when we're chasing donkeys and when we're not. Amen? We've got to learn when we're chasing donkeys. 
Amen. You get to a place and you say, Lord, what am I doing here? Lord, here I am. What, what am I doing here, Lord? I got to change directions. I, I, I got to change. Lord, what am I doing here? He said, you chasing donkeys? <laughs> let me tell you this. Let me tell you two things. Number one, Saul never saw the donkeys. Number two, they wasn't even his donkeys. Number one, Saul never saw the donkeys. If you can see something, have you ever prayed and said, Lord, if I can just see it, I can believe it. Lord, if you'll just give me a ray of hope and let me just lay my eyes on it, God, I can do better. I can have more faith. But Saul never saw the donkeys. Second thing, he was chasing his father's dream. Oh, man, You can't chase someone else's dreams. You've got to chase your own. Seek God. You cannot chase somebody else's epitaph, somebody else's dream. Somebody else's ministry. You can't chase those things because they are elusive. At Shalim, that fox will steal your life. And he's just a fox. He's not a bear. He's not a lion, but he's just a fox. Amen? And you're chasing those things. Saul learned a valuable lesson at Shalim. He said, I can't live here no more. I, I, I'm, I'm looking for my daddy's stuff. I, I, I just can't do it. I, I can't look at that. Benjamite, there's a trait here. If you followed after the Reubenites, Reuben was the firstborn. He was the favored. Everybody liked Reuben because he is the firstborn of Leah and, and Jacob. But here we are with Saul and his daddy was a Benjamite, made him a Benjamite, which was of the last. You know how it is if you got 12 children or siblings in your family, the firstborn looks down at the last and says, hmm, you ain't been through what I have. You don't know what I know. You can't do what I do. Amen? So Saul here was a Benjamite. Boy, and I'm going to tell you, he had to put up with some stuff. Turn to your neighbor and say, I put up with stuff. <laughs> Listen to this. All these places, and I told you, were in mountains and valleys and hills. You know, we used to sing that song, Over the Next Hill We'll Be Home. Well, you, Saul couldn't sing that song because he never found home over the next hill. He battled over those mountains and down through those valleys with that servant helping him. But he never laid eyes on the donkeys. And it takes an effort to climb a mountain. I'm going to camp right here just a minute now because you need to know this. There's a, there's a lot of different mountains in the Bible. They mean different things. But I really want to talk about this one, this one mountain. And this mountain is called the Mountain of Worship. When you come out of the valley, you can't worship. Because you're so burdened down by the problems and the failures and the disappointments. Amen? And you're climbing. It's hard to climb when you're disappointed. I'm going to give you an illustration. I wish you by Radio Land could see this. I'm sitting down in a chair on the pulpit. Amen? It comes by, disappointments comes by Every mountain you climb, every valley you go through, and you, you look at the next mountain and say, I just, I'm disappointed I can't climb that mountain. You make it up in your own mind, I can't climb that mountain. And listen, we claim it, we claim it for the devil, but he didn't have nothing to do with it. He just planted a seed and you let it grow. He just planted a seed in you that I can't. And you let it grow. Amen. You let that seed grow when you said, I can't. 
I can't. My daddy used to tell I'd tell my daddy. He'd say, boy, you need to go do it. I can't, daddy. He said, I can't, never can, and never will do nothing. And he'd make me do it. Amen? So when you start that mountain, that mountain of worship, when some Sundays when we come in here, I, I know Radio Land's going to be surprised, but some Sundays we come in here, we don't want to worship. Because the battles this past week has been tremendous. Like when my wife and I got back from Texas the other, the other Friday, we, we uh, didn't have any water. Looked in the backyard and it looked like a fountain of youth. I ought have jumped in it two or three times. But, <laughs> but I had a busted water line in the backyard. and I <laughs> So I had to get up early Saturday morning. I mean, I was feeling my oats. On that Saturday, I mean that Friday night we got home, I could feel I'd been in the presence of God for a whole week. Amen. Three days and five preachers a day. Man, this man was charged up like lightning. But reality set in when I got to the backyard and that water line was busted. I had to revert back to old Keith Price. Had to work on a line. You know what I did? I grabbed a shovel and a hacksaw. I went to work. Pretty soon I had that problem fixed. But sometimes we go by Shalim. And that old fox will steal our victory. <laughs> what little bit Saul had, the fox got it. Because the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Amen. It's not some great big old grizzly bear. It's not great big old main lion. Sometimes it's a little fox that steals it. He'll steal your joy. He'll steal your your victory, steal your vision. He'll steal everything that you got in Shalim because all this other stuff is dumped on you. Have you ever had a week when nothing didn't go right? <laughs> well, here's why it didn't go right. One thing won't trip you up. One thing won't defeat you. Because you can handle it. Possibly two things won't defeat you. You can handle it. But when you start dumping three and four and five things there, when every time you look around a corner, here's a problem. Every time you dig up a tree, there's another root. I mean, once you get that wagon loaded, it's hard to unload that wagon. That's where you're at in Shalim. So it don't take a big fox, it takes a little fox to spoil the vine. All these things that we are gathered, and listen, it's all designed while you're chasing those donkeys. You don't need to be out there anyway. That's your daddy's problem. Come on now. That's daddy's problem. He ought to sent two servants instead of me. I ought to have been back at the house eating scrambled eggs and bacon this morning. Amen? So here's what happened. And Shalim, that little fox, got the rest of what he had. Mm. Can you believe that? Can you believe God let him go through all of that? Somebody say amen. amen. The Lord will let you go just as far as you want to travel. I said the Lord will let you go just as far as you want to travel. Amen. But God's got another place for you. God don't ever leave you in Shalasta or Shalim. He don't leave you in them places. He's just trying to teach you something here. He won't let you build a house here. He won't let you destroy you here. He's just got you here for a reason. That's so you can learn something and draw wisdom out of what God's doing in your life. Can you say amen to that? But now listen, in verse 5 it says this. And when they will come to the land of Zuf, now, Zeph was a, a notable place here. They left all this other stuff behind them, chasing these donkeys. And they're at Zeph, and they still hadn't seen a donkey. In fact, they'd lose, they had lost sight of even a track at this time. Didn't even have a track to follow at Zeph. And the Bible said, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leaving, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought of me. In other words, come, unless my daddy comes looking for me and forgets about the donkeys. 
We've got to leave. But now Zuf has got a unique meaning. It means honeycomb. It means honeycomb. Honeycomb here means strength, nutrition. After you go through all of those battles, you need strength and nutrition. Most folks will stay out of church. They'll stay away from Zuf. They won't eat none of that honey or honeycomb. But Saul and his servant realized, I'm going to eat this honey and I'm going to eat this honeycomb. I need some strength. Amen? So here's what's going to happen. Honey was a staple in those days with those people. I mean, they would rob beehives. Uh, Samson at one time got a beehive out of a dead lion carcass, a dead bear carcass, and uh, ate it and it revived him. It's, it's, it's a reviver. It's strength when you eat honey and, and chew that honeycomb. It's strength to you. So here they were at Zuff, and they received their strength, and his servant t- turned to him and said, Listen, we're close to the man of God. <laughs> In other words, the servant says, our dilemma is almost over. Now, let me drive a stop up there and tell you that a few days prior to this day, God spoke to Samuel and told him to go to a certain place and stay a few days because he was going to send a man there. That man's name was Saul. Samuel, you're going to know him because he's a head taller than anybody else. You see, God knows the dilemma that you're in. He's just letting you go through things because when he lets you go through things and you're still serving God, there's going to be a reward at the end of it. You may not even know what God's doing in your life, but God's accomplishing something so you can experience Him and experience the walk that you have. Listen, not every step we take with God's going to be a joy. You're not going to shout every time you turn a corner. You're not going to give glory every time you come through a battle. You're not going to do all those things because you're still in the flesh. But God's going to teach us and bless us. And he's coming back after us. He told us that this morning. Amen. But it means honeycomb. This is the place where you find what you need. I'm glad I got 20 more minutes because listen to this. They have already used every resource they brought with them. In the battles that you have, you use the resources of God in your life that you have after a few days. And you see nothing, you hear nothing, you experience nothing, you lose that. But God's got a place of refuge. Amen? I said God's got a place that you can flee to and run to. David said he's my shield and my buckler. Amen? He's a strong tower where the righteous run into and they're safe. Amen? God's got a place for you to go. And when you get to that place of Zuff, he's got honey and honeycomb there. It's to sustain you. It's to give you everything that you need. And while you're there and God's refreshed you, amen, listen, after coming through a hard battle, it's refreshing to come to the house of God. It's refreshing to raise your hands and praise Him. It's refreshing to stand on your feet and glorify and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a pleasure and an honor to be a Christian. Amen. Not only to go through the, the mountains and the valleys, but to go through the worship. Amen. The mountain of worship. And when we get to that place and we worship God, it dispels everything. You'll say, man, these three days was worth it just because of the presence of God that I'm experienced now. And God replenishes us with that honey and comb. That was a major deal to be at Zuff. That was a major deal to be there at a place where God's going to give you what you need. How else is He going to know that you're going to be a good steward? If you hadn't been through the trials, hadn't been through the tribulations, somebody hadn't picked on you this week, somebody hadn't cursed you this week, 
Somebody hadn't talked bad about you, stabbed you in the back. How you know God's blessing is upon you if somebody don't do you wrong? Now listen to this. If ain't somebody doing you wrong, you ain't doing much right. Because all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, that's a promise, suffer persecutions. When you start doing something right, everybody that don't like you is going to come into the play and they're going to try to hinder you. They're going to say, I want you to go out here and look for this. I got some donkeys. And you go out there and start chasing them donkeys and you forget about the battle that you're in and you get in a worse shape than you've been in. Amen? But this is a place where you find all your need. And all this time that he was chasing the donkeys, he never saw them. Still hadn't saw them while he was eating his honeycomb. Still did not see. And I'm going to fast forward a minute. I'm going to tell you, he never saw them. Because that wasn't God's purpose for him to start with. That was his daddy's purpose for him. Sometimes fathers tell their sons, I want you to grow up and be just like me. Amen. I want you to follow in my footsteps. I want you to be CEO of the company just like I am. And the son says, I ain't going that direction. I don't want to be there. I don't like that. They don't follow the father's footsteps. Sometimes they father, father the father's footsteps. They get along right behind him. And they get in trouble. Amen? Because that wasn't his lot in life. That wasn't God's will for him or purpose for him. Amen? So let me tell you something. At Zuff, God gave them everything they needed. Once they were refreshed, once they got their strength back, once they got their courage back, once they picked up their confidence again and their faith, the servants told him, listen, we're in the country of a seer. A seer was a man or woman that saw things, visionaries. Not all seers were prophets, but all prophets were seers. Amen? And Saul said this. He said, we're going to go and see if we can find those, that seer and he can tell us where the donkeys are. Amen? Still had his mind on the donkeys. When are you going to turn that thing loose? When are you going to turn it loose? Amen. When are you going to put it to the side? When are you going to say, God, forgive me for all chasing these donkeys. I, I, I'm, I'm chasing them too far, Lord. I need to get on another trail, have another vision, have another goal. God, I'm, I need to get out of this thing. But God, I need you to help me get out and quit chasing these donkeys. Come on, praise the Lord this morning. They made it to where Samuel was. Samuel was the last judge and the first prophet. He was also a seer. So they got to Samuel. And Samuel told him, Listen, I saw you days ago. God showed you to me days ago. Well, why didn't you send me an email? Why didn't you tag a pigeon and send him to me? He didn't know where you was at either. Samuel said, I saw you days ago. God showed you to me. And God's got a plan for me. God's got a plan for you. He said, I want you and your servant to come and stay some days with me. I want us to have meals together. And Saul and his servant went with Samuel to his house and they sat down and the cook prepared them meals for days. And then Samuel told him God's will for his life. Now then, this is part two. What you're going to do after God tells you what his will is for you. Are you going to get mad at God 
and say, God, why in the world did you bring me through this junk? All you had to do, Lord, is tell No, he, if he'd have just told you, you sure enough wouldn't have went then. Amen. You, you, you sure enough wouldn't have went then. If he'd have just, God said, do this or that and the other. That's not right. You had to chase them donkeys. My wife made a profound statement a year or so ago. She's probably told some of you. She said, I believe that men pastors have been all the way around everywhere we've been to get right here at Louvain First Assembly. Amen. Amen. All the way around. Well, Saul went all the way around. Amen. He went through the land of disappointment. He went through the land of, of everything that he, he just couldn't muster up the faith and the guts to do what God wanted him to do. He was chasing donkeys that belonged to his daddy. And listen, you can't chase those things that belong to your ancestors. You can't chase them. You got to lay them aside. That's what Paul said. Every weight, if that's hindering you, you need to lay it aside. Every weight that's dragging you down. Every time you get on top of the mountain, something drags you down, throw that thing out. Like Jehu coming into Jezreel and he looked up and said, throw her out. Throw her out of the window. And Jezebel, they throwed her out of the window. It's time to throw them out. And get a hold of God. Amen. Because we are living in the last days. Now listen to this. I need to read verse 5. The latter part of it. Come and let us return. I want to go back to daddy's house. That wasn't God's will either. The prophet had to interrupt the mental anguish of Saul. He wasn't worried about the donkeys at this time. He's worried what his daddy thought about. Well, he's done left the donkeys. He's looking after me. We got to go back. And the servant had the mind of God. Listen, we're in the land of the prophet. Let me tell you something this morning. You're in the land of the prophet. God speak to us out of his word. He speaks to us out of his gifts. We're in the land of the prophet. God gives us instruction. He gives us direction. He gives us faith. He gives us encouragement. We're in the land of the prophet. You want to know what God's doing and what God's moving about? You need to be in the land of the prophet. You can't just dibble around and dabble around in daddy's old stuff or mama's old stuff or grandpa's old stuff. You need to come out from among that and get yourself a relationship with God. Fall on your face and cry out, God have mercy on me. God put me in the right direction. Listen to this. They got to Samuel. Saul didn't have a clue. He was clueless in Seattle. Saul didn't have a clue. His servant knew more than he did. His servant had more wisdom than he did. I mean, Saul didn't have a clue what was going on. Everybody called him a goodly person. He was a, 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 a goodly person. Nobody was as good as Saul, but they didn't see his heart. Because <laughs> God told Israel, said, he's going to steal your children. He's going to take your money. He's going to lead you into war. Everybody thought he was good. What's going on on the stage of the world this morning? Boy, do we need seers in the house of God now. We need people to see something, spiritual things. We need prophets in the house. Amen. I know folks don't believe in that stuff. Man, there ain't no such a thing as a prophet. There ain't no such a thing as, a, as, as all those apostles and all. There ain't no such. Yes, they are. And the body of Christ has suffered since the, the unbelief has come into the body of Christ and God's pulled some of them back. Amen. And the church world has suffered because we don't have a prophet in the land. Now listen to this. And verse 6 says, And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God. Boy, they need to be a man of God on, at the Washington, at the Capitol. It would change things. If the prophet began to rebuke 
Amen? We need a man of God in Washington, but now we need a man of God in Alabama. Sure need one in Oregon and California and some of these other states that's gone crazy running after the things of the world, chasing donkeys. Now listen, I'm fixing to close. What have you been chasing and it's not materialized in your life? We pursue God. We pursue all of our life. And we come to the end of our life and we say, Lord, what have I accomplished in my life? What have I been chasing all these years and it's not amounted to anything? It's one thing to chase after your father's dream or your mother's dream. I remember when my mom and dad got saved in 86, 85. And I worked at Wiley Sanders at that time and I come to the, that, got off work that night shift and I went by mama's and we had coffee and we were sitting there talking and the Lord had used me in the gifts in the church and her and dad was coming to the church. They got saved at Purdue and uh, we sat at that table and my mom was awestruck. She said, how does it feel for God to use you? She was awestruck. I said, mom, it's the most humbling thing I've ever experienced with God. I've never lost that feeling. I'm awestruck and humbled that God would use me. Amen. Amen. But I'm awestruck and humbled that God would use you as well because He uses those that He can trust. Jesus said, Seek and ye shall find. That word seek here means to search out by any method, specifically in worship. Have you worshiped God lately? Oh, yeah, preacher, I told the Lord I thanked No, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, have you worshiped God lately? Have you been lost in an atmosphere of worship? You know, it's hard to worship God when you're chasing donkeys. Because it gets all of your attention. It holds your mind. It holds your purpose. Chasing donkeys holds everything in your life. You've got to turn them loose. Amen? You've got to turn those things loose. Now listen here. It means to search out by any method. Specifically in worship or prayer. In worship or prayer. Is a method that we seek after God. I made this statement some years back. I said, a praying man or a praying woman can't be deceived. Because God speaks to you in prayer. He won't let you be deceived. It means to strive after. Ask. Beg. Beseech. Desire. Inquire. Make inquisition. Procure. Make a request. Or seek for. If we seek after the Lord, we'll find Him. But if we're chasing donkeys, we will never achieve the goal. You hear me this morning? If you're chasing donkeys this morning, Radio Land, if you're running after things that's not materializing, you need to lay some of those things down or all of those things down and seek after the Lord. Simply because when we seek the Lord, He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you while we're seeking after the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To seek. Amen? Eventually, His journey led Him to the prophet where God's will began to take place. All that he done prior to he got to Samuel's presence was for naught. Didn't catch a donkey. Didn't see a donkey. Couldn't tell what color that donkey was. But when he got to Samuel's presence, God's will began to materialize in his life. Agreed, he was a bad king. 
God didn't want him there, but the people of Israel chose Saul to be a king because he was a head taller than anybody else. And God said, I don't choose on the outward appearance like you do. I choose inward to the heart. That's why God chooses like he does today. He chooses the heart. Amen. Amen. Eventually his journey led there. Eventually means it took some time to get there. I remember the first time I watched T.D. Jakes on the uh, TBN broadcast. I thought to myself, wow. When did he start preaching? When did he come on the stage? And then some months after that, I heard the testimony. He said, y'all don't know who I am when I started. He said, I started pastoring a church on a dirt road. They had very few members. He said, and I had problems in that church. He said, but I preached my way off that dirt road. Nothing wrong with a dirt road. Your church is on a dirt road, that's fine. But he said, I come off of that dirt road because God didn't want me there. Every step he made to get where he's at was a step in the direction of God's perfect will. Every step that you make this morning is in the direction of God's perfect will for your life. If you can't pursue after God, if you can't seek after Him, if you're not pursuing God, then you're in the wrong place. Then you don't have a goal. It's time to pursue God this morning. Stand with me. Radio Land, it's time to pursue God. The Lord is faithful and just this morning. He's an ever-present help in a day and a time of trouble. And I know that you said that, listen, I, I've done so much bad stuff, God won't listen. That's not true. That's a lie of the devil. God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. <laughs> Bow your head with me this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I come to praise you this morning. I praise you that I'm not chasing donkeys. God, that this word has moved me. I'm going to get out of that pasture where them donkeys are at. God, I'm fixing to pursue you. Lord, I'm fixing to pursue you on a daily basis. God, for your will, your will for this church, your purpose for me, your purpose for this church, God. I pray this morning for a move of the Holy Ghost in Luverne First Assembly. I pray a move of God in everybody's life in this church. I pray a move of God, Lord, for every person on the radio. I pray, Lord, to minister. Let this word be rhema. Let it be so anointed, God, that they can't put it on the back burner. God, every morning when they get up, Lord, let them face it, chasing donkeys. I pray, Lord, let the Spirit of the Lord move on them today in the name of Jesus. For, Lord, I know that thy coming is nine hand. You spoke it to us today. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us, Lord, to win every soul to the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, before that trumpet sounds, and I've asked these things in Jesus' name, amen. What about you this morning? What are you chasing? What are you chasing? Sometimes God will give you what you're running after, but sometimes He won't. What are we pursuing? Are we pursuing the wrong thing? Maybe the right thing in a wrong direction. What are we pursuing this morning? We need to pursue God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Kish was a wealthy man. He sent his son on a trail to chase after some lost donkeys. Can I tell you this? If they all had died, Brother Randy, Kish would not have cared because he's a wealthy man. He had donkeys to take their place. You may have been far spent chasing somebody else's dream. It's time to come back. It's time to come back to that place where you started. Do your first works over. I feel the Lord in this house today. 
God spoke to us. Luverne, listen to me. We might have been chasing donkeys at times, but we're coming back to ground zero. Amen? And, and listen, I, I, I'm just going to tell you something. We're off the air. We're off the air. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Our spiritual level has been at a low height since summertime. You've looked around, you've seen people not here, and it's just, you say, I can't worship God if ain't a crowd. You need to worship God just right by yourself. If you can't worship God by yourself, you can't worship God in a crowd. Amen. Of course, I want everybody back. Don't misunderstand me. But we can't look around and be discouraged. And we can't, sh- we can't camp out at Shalim and let these little things destroy our relationship with God or our worship. We can't do it. We've got to allow God to do what He wants to do. Too many churches have got Ichabod wrote over their door. The Spirit of the Lord hath departed. Too many churches have gone the wrong way. There's one in California that went crazy as a Betsy bug. Their pastor went off the deep end. This Cuban Jesus led thousands astray. Told everybody he was Jesus and there wasn't no sin. I told him in Sunday school this morning, he died about two years ago. I said, well, he found out he wasn't Jesus. That's the condition of the church world that we're living in today. So much deception out there. And we know it's deceiving because we know what Jesus said in his book. He said, if they say Jesus is in the desert, don't go out there. There is but one Jesus Christ this morning. He's the Son of God. He died on a cross, buried in a bar or tomb, but He rose again the third day. He'll never see death again. And He's coming after me and you. He's coming after you and I. But we've got to stop chasing donkeys. We've got to let our prayer life mean something. We've got to let our witness mean something. We've got to step out of the normal, out of the commonplace, and let God be God in us. Seek the Lord while He may be found of you. God's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose for your life. Amen? We need to seek the Lord. I'm going to give an altar call. You need to come this morning. You need to come and to this altar. You need to talk to God. It ain't what your daddy wanted you to do. It's not what your mama wants you to do, but it's what, it's what God wants you to do. Come seek the Lord this morning. Chasing donkeys. My, my, my. Lord, I don't want to be found out there in the pasture chasing donkeys. I want my life to have purpose. Lord, I want it to have purpose in you. Lord, I don't want to be climbing these mountains and crossing these valleys for nothing. Lord, I want the power of God in me. I want the Spirit of the Lord alive in me. I want to be able to preach the Word. I want to be able to teach the Word. I want to be able to sing the songs of Zion with conviction and with power. This altar is open for you this morning. Come on. If you're tired and thirsty, there is freedom. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.
need to read you one more scripture here this morning. 1 Samuel 9 and verse 10. And before I read it, I want you to tell I want to tell you something. Every decision that you make for God is not in good times. It's in hard times. 